really honored to be here, especially honored to follow these talks that I've just followed. I'm very um, thrilled to be included with this group of people, so many of whom, especially you know, Deborah and Andrew, whose work, and Robert, you know, artists in their own right, and making uh, such tremendous opportunities for students and for other people to be involved in each other's art. It's really, <clears throat> it's really inspiring. Uh, also quite remarkable to be after Josh. I don't know if he's still here, but uh, he really set up some of the things I'm about to show. So we'll get started. This is 88 cores. He mentioned it's a four plus hour uh, descent through the Greenland ice sheet like this. Uh, you're looking now at snow that fell in the winter of 1989. This is starting at the top. Uh, here, about an hour and a half in, this is at the Philbrook Museum of Art in Tulsa. We're quite a bit deeper. That one meter of current snow, year after year, gets compressed into these bands, these layers of ice, through the weight of thousands, tens of thousands, in this case, years. So this is a piece about time, deep space holding very deep time. It's also a portrait. And I consider this a landscape portrait of the Greenland ice sheet. I'm lucky that Josh already told us all about the Greenland ice sheet and why I would put my focus onto a body of ice like that. Uh, I came to this notion of extended landscape, which is what I'm talking about, uh, really through my early trajectory and interest in visual perception. I'm interested in naked eye perception. How do we know where we are? How do we see what we see? How do we see beyond that? Uh, so that climate change, of course, presents a very special set of challenges with perception and scale. Uh, I think Josh also spoke about that, the difference between climate and weather. Uh, but it also really occurs in realms that are too large, too small, too fast, actually right now not quite slow enough, uh, substances that are invisible. So at some point, scientists, I mean artists or communicators dealing with climate really had to reach out to scientific observation. So that's, I suspect, why I'm here. So this being a uh, camera obscura that you know, I made in New York sometime in the 70s. Very interested in how we use our eyes or naked eyes to see what we see. Uh, a few years back, I contributed these uh, definitions, overscape and underscape, to the climate lexicon, a project by uh, Amy Howden Chapman's distance plan. Uh, overscape and underscape describe an extension of traditional landscape from, to the realms above our head and beneath our feet. Uh, and more important, the extended landscape includes our many faults, and these faults not only geological, but faults of our human intervention, our faulty distribution of land and air resources, land and air use, uh, human history, and planetary transformation. Uh -huh. I'm going to talk about three projects related to water that he mentioned, but I have other overscapes and underscapes. Uh, these are geothermal cores from under the Salton Sea, shown here uh, fairly far from the Salton Sea in Singapore, and done an ongoing project on power lines and trees here in our Los Angeles firescape. Uh, so my first project really reaching out seriously to scientific data started with the GRACE satellites, the same ones that Josh mentioned. So I'm lucky that uh, he really already set this up. Now, I saw these two satellites because I've done a lot of work in stereo, that's the visual perception again, uh, as a higher form of uh, binocular vision. So apologies, Josh, if I'm sim simplifying it, but just as my two eyes uh, enable me to perceive depth, I interpreted these two satellites rotating at you know, 90 mile distance from each other, but also a lag in time, uh, their ability to ping uh, the Earth and detect minute changes of gravity and detect depth or the levels of water. Uh, and so this map was this was a revelation. It was hugely important uh, because it was the first map re you know, revealing the global distribution of water, a whole Earth vision of the Earth's distribution of water. 2010 was also a fairly interesting time in that designers around the world were getting access to uh, data visualization tools and were very, becoming very enthusiastic about the notion of data viz. And so I had this grand 
scheme idea to create a series of uh, indicators of global beacons on these perhaps different uh, boundaries that, that all these talented uh, designers could use this data that was coming in and create digital beacons or, uh, bound, or indicators. And what better place for a global beacon, I thought, than Times Square? Uh, so I went back to where I'd gotten my start with my first job in computer graphics working behind that sign animating light bulbs. And fully 30 years later, in 2011, my message to New Yorkers in the Overscape went from touch here to a giant QR code uh, appealing to designers to help us visualize and understand groundwater levels. Of course, we use data from the GRACE satellites, so I, I hope Josh is here uh, if he doesn't know about this project, but we used, uh, J. Famiglietti Yeti helped us, we used uh, USGS data, JPL, NASA data, and this is the winning animation from a Dutch artist, Richard Vihan. So this isn't strictly my pictorial work, but this was the project that led me to um, all these two other works I'm about to show. Uh, it was shown, we mapped it onto these you know, rather unusual non-standard screens in Times Square. It was shown for six months, and people engaged with it, also a very important part of this, uh, accessing it from around the world. So I returned to Los Angeles, 2012, also a year of gripping drought. And in the, exper you know, the spirit of visualize locally, I turned my attention really for the first time to the Los Angeles aquifer. So I thought I'd get a data set, it would be almost the same, and, but without the benefit of uh, the GRACE satellites or NASA satellites, it proved to be a lot harder to get data a data set on Los Angeles water. And that is because the people who make the considerable effort to map our underground, because it's solid ground, you know, are looking for something. And it costs a lot. And it, they're looking for water. They're looking for energy. They're looking for minerals. And they don't always share. So I found that the data was a patchwork of uh, different agencies, private, public municipalities. And I decided I would just start over from the beginning. So I was referred to the series of maps created of the aquifer created by the Department of Water Resources in 1961. Now, this is a very good place to point out that 1961 in the parlance of deep space, deep time, is current. So these are still considered current uh, maps or diagrams or or maybe an accurate representation of the Los Angeles aquifer. But I found it very puzzling. Uh, and we can take a look. I'm going fast. So this is a section. These are section cuts. This one at the Harbor Freeway. There's a nice map showing all the places these maps were made. And it appears when I'm looking at this that there's these deep blue, clear flowing rivers under our city. And I, I've lived here a long time, and I wondered how is it that I'd never heard of these bodies of water? It's the Silverado, the Sunnyside, the Gage, why weren't there sports teams, uh, movie studios named after them? And of course, I hadn't heard of them because this is a total fiction. Not a lie exactly, because they're labeled in the one previous, the slide previous to this, idealized section. But it's misleading. And it's misleading in a way that is actually deeply troubling, because image matters. Our picture of the world, our idea, our actions are based on what we think we know about the world. And these views and show abundance. You know, There are no deep blue rivers under Los Angeles, even if a Google image search on the word aquifer shows it that way. So I felt we needed a view that was more real than ideal. So uh, I went back to this, and I uh, was schooled by a very patient USGS hydrologist that these vertical lines indicate drilling sites. And the paths of these, not rivers, but zones of different types of sediment, sand and shale and clay, uh, that handle rock water differently, uh, are inferred from material inside these skinny little lines and scooped into boxes like this. So these shells at the California Water Center in San Diego hold a literal deep 
water deep space landscape of the uh, Southern California going back two and a half million years. And in case you were wondering, because I had to ask, these numbers indicate feet in depth. So, you know, I'm going to do this. It's 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet. And if, like, if you're like me, you need to, I can do it here, I had to rotate it. And this rotation I w became the instantaneous need to descend through this, in a sense, as though on an elevator. I mean, imagine for a second that all you knew about our above ground was inferred from the inside of many different randomly placed telephone poles. We'd have a very different view of our world. So this became the <clears throat> really instantaneous storyboard for what became under LA, projecting the Los Angeles aquifer onto the Los Angeles River. Uh, we went back and photographed this, uh, stacked them, and together with uh, Rafik Anadol, projected them onto the banks of the river for current LA, uh, commissioned by the, Los, by the city of Los Angeles for current LA River. This is uh, water. This is uh, the First Street Bridge site. Uh, this is the origin of LA River site. Uh, this gives you a short sense of the scale of the piece, perhaps. And this is another photograph from the origin of LA River. This may not look like water. It's not clear, it's not blue, but this is the landscape of water under Los Angeles. So this is the point to say that when I call these landscape portraits, and I'm using scientific data, or data or work from science, that they are not scientific documents. that are informed by science, but they're also not scientific illustrations. They really have no use to the scientists at all. The purpose is very different. The point of a portrait, a landscape portrait, is an opportunity to sit with, to feel, to uh, in, see or portray one's sight, by which I'll extend to a, our situation, a very current troubled situation. So uh, back to ice cores. Uh, ice cores are considered paleo thermometers. Uh, this is the one we started with. As you get deeper, uh, the, you can start to see the compression. The bands can be counted like tree rings. Particulate mass uh, can be correlated with earthly events, planetary events such as uh, this volcanic eruption. I just found them to be extraordinarily beautiful. When I found out that these cores, or what I considered, an, what I heard was a mile-long ice core, and I called it a pole, an ice pole, was stored in one meter canisters horizontally, you can guess what I wanted to do. I immediately wanted to put one back together again. You know, again, imagine sitting uh, under a, an enormous redwood tree and allowing your eyes to pan from top to bottom. Uh, and imagine if all we knew of a redwood tree was, you know, the this, this, uh, trunk in, you know, in a number of um, one meter canisters. We'd want to put it back together. So I was lucky that I got to work directly at the, what is now called the uh, NSF Ice Core Facility in Lakewood, Colorado. I originally uh, hoped to have all 3,000 meters of this core, but faced with the reality of digitizing fragile and frozen ice cores, I settled for 88. This is the visual score of the piece. Uh, it is also my favorite exhibition venue ever. Uh, they're tacked onto the outside of the, the freezer you saw with all those ice cores with essentially refrigerator magnets. I also thought, and I think there was a question here, you know, what, what you find and what you think you're going into as you begin a project and what you find are often very different. And I, my original idea was that it, this would be like this, that the whole descent would be this beautiful cerulean gorgeous banded thing, and of course it's not like that because the real world is different. Not only does the ice change with depth and pressure, and are different, there are different characteristics, uh, but there's human intervention here. There's human use of it. There's science using it. The pieces that are cut out, I thought I'd have a pointer, but you know, there are chunks 
pointed out here, and those are very carefully cut, and they're sent to uh, labs around the world who are studying. This is how we know about climate change. The mar some of them are marked, some of them are broken. Um, this is the reality. Also, the color is, is not true. Ice, like water, is clear. The, the variation in color is due to the range of techniques of digitizing from 1990 to 2016. It changes. Are you using LEDs? Are you using incandescent? Are you lighting from above, from below, from a side? So this is a portrait of the Greenland ice sheet as we know and understand it. And it's an opportunity to sit with it. Uh, I was very fortunate that I was, uh, it was part of the inaugural exhibit at the Climate Museum, aptly named uh, in human time. Uh, the public aspect of the piece was very important to us. Uh, we took the shades up at night so that passersby on Fifth Avenue could see the ancient light uh, at the same time as the light of the city. I think I put one frame here of uh, a fire truck going by just because we're in Los Angeles and it's about to be fire season. Finally, uh, I want to make the point, because I'm not really showing the piece, uh, that 88 Cores is not silent. It has a score. Uh, the score is by Celia Hollander. And what I'm going to do is show 30, a 30-second 30 clip with sound and take questions after. But first, I'll read a short part of her statement just to set the tone for the more meditative, contemplative uh, intention of the piece. So Celia wrote, Perhaps time is more linear and asymmetrical on the scale of human perception, but more cyclical and symmetrical on a massive scale, one that we can comprehend but can't easily perceive. 88 Cores uses a linear approach, scrolling from top to bottom as a type of temporal section cut. Reading this section cut suggests that there's a beginning and an end, but what came before and what will become after? What will come after? Will the Nerf future be like the distant past? And whose future? Whose past? The one belonging to the ice? Or the humans? Or the earth?